welcome in our hall D, and I would like to uh, introduce Andy Borrell from Oculus, who will have the presentation from start to ship, life cycle of a game on o Oculus. And is an engineer on Oculus Developer Relations team in the UK, in, in London, he works. He works with developers across Europe in bringing new and existing titles to VR and on Rift and GER VR. He also leads the development of Oculus uh, sa sample framework for Unity. And so the floor is yours. Welcome, Andy. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, so yeah, so I'm an engineer at Oculus, and today I'm going to talk about the, the journey, the life cycle that you go through as you bring your VR game from concept through to publishing and selling on our store. Now, that is something that you're planning on doing, isn't it? Because uh, you know, maybe it should be. So some of you um, may have heard our statistic that we released last week, that over the previous month, uh, over a million people used the Gear VR. That's a million different people. Um, and that's just one of the headsets around at the moment. This year we're seeing a lot of major headsets released from key players, as you know. And it's a time when VR is really starting to take hold and there's a lot of consumer interest. And we expect to see a lot more people in VR this coming year. So now is really the time to be thinking about VR development. So if we assume that you're working on a VR game, the first thing you would think about is what hardware are you targeting? So I'm just going to do a very quick overview of the Oculus platform, the Oculus hardware. The, the first of these is the Gear VR. Can I just have a, just out of interest, a quick show of hands, how many people have tried the Gear VR? Oh yeah, that's pretty good. So the Gear VR is a collaboration between Oculus and Samsung at various levels. Um, if you haven't seen the device, it's a, it's a lightweight, portable headset where the phone, uh, any one of these phones, so most recent Samsung phones will snap into the front of the headset uh, with the phone providing the, the display and the processing power and the headset providing uh, the optics and uh, high fidelity gyroscope and, and motion sensor. Um, and because of this close collaboration that we have with Samsung, we have some really low level optimizations in there that combined with this technology make it a really good um, compelling VR device. And it comes in at less than $100, so it's a really good accessible VR headset. Uh, it's actually also a, a pretty powerful gaming platform. Um, there's some good features that make it a good target. So one of the things is the, the touchpad that's on the side of the headset. So everyone who has a Gear VR can use this touchpad, which is a great interface for gaze-based interactions. There's also, uh, the touchpad can also obviously work for gestures, so you can do swipes, scrolls, um, and that works really well. You also have access to the built-in microphone on the phone, and the phone's audio socket is exposed, so we expect most people to be using headphones with the Gear VR. So you've got headphones and, an, and a microphone, which is all you need for great social experiences as well. So we already are seeing a lot of really interesting social experiences on the Gear VR, and it's a really good platform for that. I'm also going to point out that you do have access to the Bluetooth on the phone, so it is possible to target a Bluetooth gamepad, and we do see some high-profile games such as Minecraft, already doing that. Uh, you should bear in mind that there's no gamepad bundled with the Gear VR, so not everyone is going to have the gamepad. So it's something to think about. It's an option, but um, if you target the, the touchpad, then that's something that everyone can use. And the, uh, the controller uh, adoption is still relatively low. So of course, the other headset is the Oculus Rift. Now, the Rift is the culmination of a journey uh, that began in, with a prototype in Parmalucky's garage and uh, has kind of developed through many iterations, through the DK1 and the DK2. Uh, I was going to ask again, how many people have tried a DK1? Okay, how many people have tried the DK2? Okay, it's about the same. I think mostly the same people. So the, DK, the, uh, the consumer Rift is a similar step forward from the DK2 to what the DK2 was from the DK1. Significantly improved resolution, optics, display technology, uh, build quality, and of course now uh, additions such as the built-in headphones and the built-in microphone. Uh, I'm going to quickly call out the built-in head headset again. The, it's actually really kind of a, a unique opportunity in PC gaming 
to, as developers, know exactly what the audio hardware that the player is going to be listening to your audio through. So, I mean, the headset, the earphones are removable. You can use your own earphones if you want to, but we do expect the majority of people to be using the built-in ones, which means that you as audio engineers and designers can really optimize, tune, and perfect the audio that you want people to hear. And that's really important in VR. Um, it really adds to the immersion, uh, and it's a really important part of the experience. Uh, the built-in microphone as well also enables these, these really great social experiences. Now, in the box, it's not just the headset. The player will also get the Oculus Remote, which is a, a simple remote, which is kind of the analog of the touchpad on the Gear VR, enabling people to um, browse simpler content and experiences that don't require as complex interaction as with a gamepad. There's also the sensor. The sensor is what enables positional VR. The sensor is very easy to set up. You literally take it out of the box, stand it on your desk, plug it in, and that's it, you've got VR working. Um, the gamepad, again, I'm going to call out the gamepad specifically because it's really good for developers to know exactly what the input device that people are going to use. On PC, it's pretty much unheard of to know that all the players you're targeting are going to have the same input technology. It's like developing for a console in that you can really carefully tune and perfect and create a great user interface. And for some types of games, like if you're flying in a in your cockpit in a Valkyrie, or you're driving in project cars, or you're playing a platformer, then a gamepad really is the best type of controller that a player could be playing with. So that's pretty exciting. But some of you may have heard about another input technology we're developing uh, and have developed called Oculus Touch. So we've all seen it. Someone goes into VR for the first time. They, they realize they can look around in all directions. They're totally immersed in this VR world, and they're blown away. But the next thing they say is, where are my hands exactly? Uh, and it's true that hands really are the most natural and intuitive way to interact with a VR environment. Um, Oculus Touch is kind of the, the result of many iterations and a lot of development to really create touch controllers that are really ergonomic and natural to use and do just kind of disappear in your hand and you forget that you're using them. The, the touch controllers do come with an extra sensor so it's the same sensor as came with the headset. So again, you just put it on the desk, point it in your general vicinity, and now you've got a, an enlarged volume that you can really move around in and, and reach around in. The, um, the really great thing, though, isn't just that you can use these touch controllers to pick things up and throw things and, and shoot guns. It actually really blows open the social channel. When you're in a virtual environment with another person, you've got the microphone, you've got the headphones, so you can hear and already speak to them. But when you can see their head and you can see their hands in VR, then it really enables you to really start gesturing and pointing and collaborating. And it really brings you into the same space and really makes that VR experience much more amazingly social and enables a lot of interesting experiences. The controllers do also have classic controls as well. So you've got two sticks, uh, one stick on each hand, two triggers on each hand, four buttons across the controllers. And there are some touch, surface, touch sensitive surfaces on there as well. So it's a pretty versatile controller. Now, at this point, I'm going to say that if anybody is working on experiences that will make use of touch or would really benefit from this kind of technology, then we have developer kits now, and we can, we can you know, get into the process of sending those out. So I'll, I'm going to show an email address later in the talk. So please do get in touch if you're working on stuff with this kind of technology. And then a consumer launch is later this year. So that was a really quick look at the hardware. Now I'm going to talk about designing for VR. Now VR design is obviously an enormous topic. I'm not going to like, cover everything. But there's a few things which are especially relevant for VR design. Now, before I say what the, the main thing is I want to talk about, um, how many people have been on a virtual roller coaster? Now, how many of you found that 100% comfortable? Yeah, none of you. Um, so comfort is, of course, a really important thing to, to, to bear in mind when working on VR development. Now, the main cause of discomfort is moving the camera in the game independently from the player's head movement. I'm sure you all know that. Now, this could be caused from a vehicle, like in the case of a roller coaster, but it can also be caused by things like some of the first-person controls. The real worst offender is 
rotating, not so much movement. Movement is, can cause discomfort, but rotating the camera independently of the player's head movement is particularly bad for comfort. And, and this includes movement that just comes from the stick on first-person controls. Now, I'm not saying don't make first-person games, but comfort is something that needs to be at the front of your brain at all times, and every decision you make needs to bear comfort in mind. And it's just something to be thinking about as you think about what kind of game you're making and how it works. So now I'm going to um, move on and look at a couple of case studies. I'm going to show two videos um, of games that have been developed. One game which has been developed from scratch to be a VR game, and another one which is the other sort of case is a game which already had a franchise outside of the VR world, and they've made a version and brought it to VR. So the first of these, um, this is Airmet Command. So Airmet Command is Carbon Games' Airmet game, which is kind of a, a fast-paced action RTS type game, um, brought to VR in a way that um, really takes advantage of VR and actually makes it a more fun experience even than it was on the desktop. Uh, if you haven't seen the game, the game is basically you're controlling this uh, mech commander, uh, you use the gamepad to move him around and he can morph between a, like a ground-based robot type character and a flying aerial air mech, an air mech. Uh, and this air mech can pick up units, move them around the map and they fight autonomously for you. And because it's an RTS, you expand out onto the map and you take control of other fortresses on the map and they produce more units for you and you keep fighting and, and dominate the map. Just gonna, before I talk any more, I'm gonna show a video of some gameplay. Okay, um, so the interesting thing about Emek is that before Emek, when people thought about games for VR, the RTS strategy kind of game wasn't something that people normally thought about. And the Carbon Games guys just sort of, as an experiment, tried putting a VR camera in one of their existing titles, another Emek game, and actually realized that it was quite cool to be in VR in that kind of game and to be able to sort of lean around and look at the, your units, which kind of feel like they're just there, and it sort of allowed them to really get a, a sense of the scale and the, the positions of everything and really appreciate the, the lay of the terrain. And then they started experimenting and this kind of led to a series of experiments where they tried, you know, they thought, what, how would it be if we put the game on a, on a tabletop and you're sort of standing next to the table and you're playing there? And they sort of tried putting the camera inside of the game so you're sort of floating above the battleground. And it sort of led to a, a whole load of, of sort of problem solving and development, which eventually led to Airmet Command, and they've really solved a lot of really inter interesting problems along the way and made something that really uses VR really well. So now I'm going to show a video. So this is another video of Airmec that I've made to try and talk about and illustrate some of the things which I think they've done really well. So the first one I want to talk about is scale. So in VR, you always have a decision to make about how big things are. Like in, in a normal game, as long as you can see it all on the screen, it's fine. But in VR, because it's stereo, you actually get a sense of you know, how, how think, how, kind of what size things are. So they've, they've put everything in the interesting. There's like a, a range of human depth perception where we have most accuracy, which is between 50 centimeters and two or three meters. So here, for example, this mech, obviously you can't see it on the screen, but in VR, it really feels like that's just kind of floating in front of you. And that's because they've put this in this. It's probably about, I don't know, 40 centimeters away from me at that point. Um, and that's the really interesting range where things feel really solid and tangible. The next thing, because it's an RTS game, obviously there's quite a large map to move around in. So that raises the question of how do you navigate that map? Uh, at the moment, you can see the camera's fixed. Like, and one possibility might have been to say, maybe have the camera in VR follow the mech around as it's flying. Obviously, that's not going to be very comfortable. You get pretty sick if the camera was on the back of that. 
So what they've done is they've chosen to have this sort of circular working area that you can see. You currently have access to this area. Your camera is fixed in the area, and you can control the mech, and then the mech moves across the edge, and it teleports you to a new location centered on another circle of area that you can see. The teleports are really comfortable. It's a really, really comfortable way to move around a map. They've actually, they do compromise a little bit, and they do show a couple of frames in between along the way. Now, this doesn't affect comfort too much, um, not particularly at all, actually, but it does obviously give you a, a better sense of the relationship between where you've come from and where you're going, and it helps you build up a, a better, more, um, more accurate spatial map in your head of what's going on. Um, so another advantage of this sort of only render and show things in a, in a circle technique is that it means, obviously it's a performance benefit because they're not rendering as much, uh, but also it means that you can see in the background beyond that circular area, there's this kind of base environment. There's the opponent that you're um, battling against stood over there, but also you can see there's kind of, there's a building that you're in. This actually is, represents your base, and later in the game, if you're your own base starts to take damage, then you see the damage reflected uh, on this environment. But the really interesting thing, the really powerful thing, is that because this base is always there and you can always see it, it gives you a, a stable reference, a grounding. So now even when I start teleporting around like this, you can also zoom in and out, so you'll see me zoom in and out. That base is always there in the background, so it's kind of reducing the sense of movement and, and really helping the comfort. Another cool thing that that allows them to do, having this circular area means they've now got the option of using the cylinder around the outside of, the, of that play area, which represents, is, basically works as a mini-map. So you can, you can see that these dots represent units that are off the edge of this play area. So these green dots here are, are my units that are about to come onto the edge. And uh, the red dots are the enemy units. There's a lot more of them than there are of me. So speaking of, of UI, any, any RTS game will normally have some kind of menu system for choosing what units to build. And rather than cluttering up the world with some head-locked UI or having it over the battlefield, they've, they've gone for the option of having this uh, menu, which is up here. So I'm controlling that there with a gamepad. It's really easy to use, and it's always in the same place relative to the real world, so I can always look up and find it. Uh, and it just keeps that, the play area that you can see there free from any kind of clutter. And it's just really intuitive. And it kind of avoids you having stuff in the game world, which breaks emotion a little bit um, by reminding you that it's a game by showing a menu floating in front of you. And so that works really well. So that was a really quick look at some of the things that I think Emmet Command does, does really well to take advantage of VR. The next thing... So the next game is a game that was designed from the ground up for VR. Uh, this is, of course, Lucky's Tale. Lucky's Tale is, is Playful's um, platform. It's really designed to be a really kind of vibrant, delightful, fun platformer that, that takes advantage of VR to be um, a platformer that kind of goes beyond a typical platform and does things that you can only do in a VR platformer. So this is Lucky. First thing you'll notice is that Lucky can actually see you as a player, so he makes eye contact and, and responds to you, which gives it a very personal feel to start with. It's interesting, people, after they've been playing Lucky's Tale, will actually talk about things that we did. They'll say, oh, we went here, we did this, and it's kind of showing that they've actually, somehow they're thinking about it as if there was two of them doing it. Now, I'm going to bring up the topic of scale again. Um, it matters in a platform as much as it does in an RTS. I know the Playful guys actually experimented with scale a lot. I think at one point they actually had Lucky being like a five-foot-tall fox who stood next to you, which uh, I think had pros and cons. Um, maybe it was a bit weird. And one of the downsides to that was that it meant the levels were like, enormous and it looked like they were miles long and you were going to have to trek to the other side of it. So they've, again, they've settled on everything being in this sort of 50 centimeters to two or three meters range. Lucky himself is about 12 centimeters tall. Uh, and that, that kind of makes everything feel very solid and tangible again, and it really makes it easy to, to judge distances and, and get a feel for it. So now you'll see Lucky's running around here, and as he does, you'll notice that the camera is moving. So as I said, the camera movement is a cause of discomfort. So there's, there's a lot of things that Playful have had to do to, to mitigate that and to make it, despite this movement, something that's actually comfortable for a lot of people. 
So the first thing you'll notice is, of, of course, the, the movement is, is carefully damped, uh, and that's the result of a lot of experimentation. But more importantly, you'll notice that right here, Lucky's jumping up and down onto the fence, on boxes, and despite his vertical movement, the camera that's following him around is only moving on a horizontal plane. And it's only when he changes level that you'll see that the camera moves to a new level. So right now, he's going to jump off. There we go. Now the camera moves slowly to this new level. Now people are very sensitive, more sensitive to vertical movement than they are to horizontal movement. So that really goes a long way to improving the comfort. Just to demonstrate again, there's Lucky jumping up really high, and the camera stayed on that single horizontal plane. Uh, if you remember, I also said that the worst offender is rotation. Uh, at the moment, you'll see that there's no rotation apart from... I'm rotating, rotating my head, so that's rotating, but apart from that, uh, Lucky went across the bridge, he's changed direction, and the camera is always staying behind Lucky in the same location relative to him, which means that there's no uncomfortable camera rotations. The downside of that is that it means that the level designers ha have had to be very clever to ensure that Lucky is always kind of going in the same general direction. So right now, he can go in the direction he's going, he can go a bit to the left, he can go a bit to the right, but he actually can't go back towards you now, even if you wanted to. So the designers have been very clever to make it that you actually never need to do that. All the levels are set up so that you're always kind of progressing in one general direction. It also means the designers have had to make sure that you never get any geometry in between Lucky and the camera that would obstruct your view of him. I'm also going to quickly call out here, you notice that the numbers appear on the coins as you collect the coins. That's just another good way of, of minimizing any on-screen UI that, that breaks immersion. The only things that you can see are, are part of the world. So having those numbers actually on the coins really sort of, it's just an, an easy way of doing that. And, and throughout Lucky's Tale, there's, there's little mini-games like this. So this is another thing that's can only be done in VR. So again, it, not only is it a, a VR-specific thing, um, so I'm using my gaze there to, to aim the bombs for Lucky, but it's another kind of um, thing that kind of gives you that feeling of collaboration. So it feels like I'm aiming and Lucky's throwing. So it, it makes people feel like there's a bit of a, a teamwork thing going on there. So you'll notice now Lucky's just walked across this bridge, and this bridge, the direction of it is on the borderline of what is comfortable um, so remember, we're not doing any camera rotation, so there's no way that we can rotate the camera around to look back down the bridge. So if I'm lucky to walk back along it, we'd maybe be going a little bit too close to, towards the camera. So they've put these teleport points to get around that, to teleport him back to this point in the level so that he can continue forward. This bridge would be an even better example. So if, he, if you wanted Lucky to walk back along here, then the camera, um, Lucky would actually be basically walking towards you and you'd be looking down like this. So the designers would never make it so that you had to do that. They would either just make it so that there was no need, or if there was a need, they'd have, probably have one of those teleport points there. Uh, another thing I want to call out about Lucky's Tale while we're here is that you'll notice that a lot of the detail in the game, instead of being made up with complex textures, is made up with intricate geometry. And that's a really good tip for VR in general, because it means that you, know, you can perceive the detail really well in 3D, and it really comes across quite easily. Um, and it, it, you know, it, it feels very solid. Right, so that concludes my quick tour of um, some of the tricks that has been used in, in VR games to really to solve some of these VR problems. Uh, and I'm going to move on to talk about uh, building your game. So having thought about the design of it, you've got a game, you're beginning to build it. Um, now you have a choice of engine. Luckily, as you know, we have some really good integrations in both Unity and Unreal. We also have engine integrations in Stingray and CryEngine. And if you're not using one of those engines, we also have the C++ SDK that you can use to incorporate this into your own, um, your own engines or your own game, which is a proprietary engine. But I think most people probably fall into one of these categories who are using Unity or Unreal. So I'm going to, I'm going to do another survey. I think this is the last one. How many people are working on a are now using Unreal? OK, and Unity? OK, significantly more. How many of you are actually doing a project now which is a VR project? OK, good. So we have very close relationships with Epic and Unity. So we have really good um, native integrations into both of these engines. These are, these are engines that are, that are used extensively internally. 
Uh, they support both the Rifts, both of them, uh, and the Gear VR. And one of the cool things is that you can actually preview in the editor. So I know, obviously, if you're working with one of these engines, then you're used to being able to make changes and quickly see the results in the editor without actually doing a build. Well, you can do the same thing in VR. You can just put the headset on and, and take a look without having to do a whole build. This is actually a really useful way to work, even if you're working on a Gear VR game. Uh, switching build targets between the Rift and the Gear VR is really just like an option. So you can use the Rift as your sort of prototyping tool, and you can be making changes just in the editor, look at how it's going, and then every now and then again doing uh, a Gear VR build just to check on how it looks and, of course, for performance. So the projects that they've been used for internally, um, in the case of Unreal, all of the Oculus Story Studio titles, Lost and Henry, have used Unreal. Uh, we've actually released the source to the Henry trailer, which is a, a pretty good reference if you're working on a title on a VR project for Unreal. And on the Unity side of things, some of our first party projects like Lucky's Tale that you just saw is based on Unity. And of course, Oculus Home, the home environment, which I'll, I'll look at a bit more later, is also based on Unity. In terms of samples, we, um, we've got some Unreal samples coming soon. And on the Unity side of things, we, we've got a project called the Unity, uh, it's called the Oculus Sample Framework, and it is built on Unity. It's really intended as a, like a sandbox, uh, a set of experiments that people can play around with um, in VR. So it, it explores some of the common problems, like different types of motion, different types of VR-based. And you can vary some of the parameters for these things, actually, in VR. So you can load up a teleport sample. And in VR, you can, say, tweak the time delay between teleports, that kind of thing. Um, but as well as being designed as a, a VR design reference, it is also a, a, a sample on Unity that we've released the source for. So it's a good reference as well if you're working on a Unity project. And one very cool thing about both of these engines is that soon they'll both be releasing the ability to actually use the editor itself in VR. So you can actually start manipulating your level and designing things and moving things around with Oculus Touch actually in VR, which is going to be very cool. So having chosen your engine, and I want to make you stop for a minute and think about audio. And we all know that audio is really important in game design, game development. It's especially important in VR. Poorly implemented audio will damage VR immersion. Now, the human brain is really sensitive to a whole load of subtle cues in the real world that help you pinpoint the location of a sound. Some of these cues are obvious, like a sound being on the left-hand side of you will be louder on the left than it is on the right. But there's a whole load of complicated things going, along, uh, going on with uh, that are frequency dependent and depend on direction as well. This kind of has to do with the way sounds interact with the shape of your head and the shape of your ears. Some sounds, some certain frequencies will pass through your head and arrive at both ears. Uh, you also get some frequencies which will diffract around your head or, or reflect off your shoulders. There's also kind of resonance and reflection effects that actually happen in the shape of your outer ear itself, uh, which also depend on frequency and direction. Uh, it's all these kind of effects together we call a head-related transfer function. And you're subconsciously really sensitive to these. And you, this is what the brain uses to know very accurately the direction of a sound, not just the direction, but the actual position of a sound source. Uh, there's other things as well, like the propagation delay. Um, a sound will arrive at one ear before the other ear. If it's in front of you, then it arrives at both ears at the same time, but if it's over here, then it's going to hit this ear before this ear. And that's another cue that subconsciously you're, you can pick up on and, and use to detect the position of a sound source. Obviously, reflections are important. Like in here, you can hear the reflections off the, the walls. Uh, also, the reflections off your own shoulders are important. You can use that subconsciously again to detect if a sound is above or below you. And if all of these kind of effects aren't emulated to some extent in VR, then on some level, you're going to be aware of something not being quite right, and it's going, to be, it's going to be damaging to the immersion, and it's also going to make it harder for you to pinpoint the source of these sounds. So that's why I'd recommend that you use our audio SDK, which actually does simulate all of these effects. Uh, it's a freely available SDK. It comes with a Unity plugin, an Unreal plugin. There's also FMOD and WI's integrations. Uh, it's actually free to use even if you're doing a, non, a project that isn't VR, or you're developing for other headsets, or, or whatever. You can use it completely freely.
There's more to it than that, though. Now that you've got the right audio engine, you need to think about audio design and the placement of your audio sources. So let's take this dinosaur as an example. Say this dinosaur is walking down a corridor towards you. In a, in a traditional game on desktop, even with surround sound, you probably get away with having the sounds of the footsteps and the roar of the dinosaur all coming from the same place. In VR, it's going to sound weird. And you're going to realize that those sounds are all coming from the same position. So just bear that in mind. And you, you want to have sounds actually coming from the place that they really should be coming from. Some of the tips include you want to have mono sound sources. Uh, the stereo effect actually obviously comes from the, the audio engine and the simulation of these effects. Wideband sounds are better than narrow band because a lot of these effects work much more uh, powerfully at, at high frequencies. Ambient sounds can catch people out. Um, think carefully about the design of ambient sounds. If you just have a, a loop that's playing in the background without it spatialized, then people are maybe going to notice that some sounds don't really have a source. Uh, on, a, on the other hand, if you have a whole ambient track localized to one specific place, then people will actually find that. They'll like, track out and find the, the source of this, of this ambient sound. Um, but all of this work is worth it because you know, it, it adds to the immersion. And one of the things about VR, of course, is that people can look in any direction. So audio is a great way to actually guide people's attention and to aid to the storytelling as well. So it's worth thinking about. So now, moving on, you've got your game looking great, got it sounding great. Uh, you should think about the social features. Um, social is obviously important in all games these days. Uh, it's especially important in VR. Uh, the Oculus platform is a platform that extends across Rift and Gear VR. So if you have an account on one as a player, then you have an account on the other as well. So any friends you make uh, through the Rift are your friends on Gear VR as well. So I would recommend you at least use our leaderboards and achievements. But the really powerful thing about social in VR is, of course, when you're actually sharing a VR environment with someone and you're, you're in there and you're both in the same space and interacting together, that's really powerful. So we want to make sure you have all of the tools to do that. And this includes peer-to-peer -peer networking, matchmaking, invites. And very soon as well, we're releasing uh, voice over IP technology, which you can use for encoding and decoding and use over our peer-to-peer -peer networking that we already provide. So definitely take a look at that. So I'm coming um, to the next part of the talk, which is about actually uploading, publishing, and being on the store. Now, this slide is entitled Uploading Your Build. But I want to stress at this point that although it comes after all of the slides about building and designing, it shouldn't be at the very end of the process. You know, we do want to be involved at all stages. It's impossible to upload a build and have it accidentally go live. So there's no reason why you shouldn't be totally trigger happy uploading builds whenever you have something remotely interesting. You know, we really like to look at builds early on and, and work with you and, and give feedback. So I, I'm based in the UK, so I'm one of the DevRel team in the UK who will be working with you. Um, I, I cover all of Europe. So I'm, you know, and the rest of the team, we'll be looking at these builds and giving feedback at, at all points in the process. So yeah, please do upload builds. The actual process itself is just, you know, you create an app here, give it a name, give it some other details, and there's literally, a, you just drag and drop a zip file, and it goes onto our servers. We actually do have some channel management stuff as well, so you can assign a particular build to a particular channel. So you might have a release candidate, which is what you're considering releasing. You could also have a beta channel, which is what you're using internally, and you can distribute that um, through the platform to other people. And you could have a QA channel as well, for example. And that brings me to Oculus Home. Oculus Home is the, the first thing that people see every time they put on uh, a VR headset, whether it's the Rift or the Gear VR. It's, it's the starting point. It's the place where people can see their friends, see their library of content, uh, discover new content, uh, and it's where people launch games. The, the Home environment is basically the same on the Rift and the Gear VR. Both versions do have a, a 2D equivalent, so on desktop there's a uh, a flat application, and there's a mobile app as well, so you can see your friends and, and browse content there too. But of course, the, the really interesting thing about Home is that it's the gateway to the store, which is where you as developers want to end up. And we have a really um, a great store team that's staffed by industry veterans. And we take the store really seriously. 
And the priority of the store team is to truly optimize the store both for players and developers. From the player's point of view, the store is, is very carefully curated. Um, we do say no to some things because we want to ensure that the quality of the store enables people to find really good quality content really easily and um, make it easy to discover new content as well. And from the point of view of the developers, the store is optimized to help you be successful. And the store team will be working closely with you once your game is published to manage promotions, sales, featuring, uh, to really help you be successful. So I'm coming to the end of the talk now. And finally, I just want to say that, that we are here to help. And really, uh, I want you all as developers to be talking to us talking to us throughout this development process, whether it's getting hardware to be developing on, helping to solve engineering problems, or working with the store team after launch and, and, on, and going forward to, to manage your game on the store. And we're only successful when you are, so, so we really want to help and work together. Uh, that's all I have. Yeah, we'll do questions. Do you want to do the announcement first? or? This is, this is Tina from our DevRel team as well. Hi, everyone. Um, I work on the Gear VR side of things. So if you're a mobile developer interested in making mobile VR, you should definitely come find me after the talk. In the back of the room, my colleague Paul Yastrzewski is from Poland, local. He handles touch and rift development. So if you're interested in touch and rift development, he's the guy to be talking to. He's in the, the white sweater. Um, and also, as a special thank you for coming to the talk and showing your interest, we have um, brought 100 Gear VR with us. So um, come meet us at the back of the room, and everybody that is here can leave with a Gear VR. We hope you'll use it to get familiar with the store, to play some of our top games, and to start development, um, and to you know, start a dialogue with us. Uh, so we can open it up to Q&A if you're comfortable with that, Andy. And so if you have a question, please raise your hand, stand up, and speak loudly. Okay, we have the microphone, so I will be passing it to you. Hi, just a quick question from a service provider's point of view. How are you going to handle your compliance, so your manufacturer standards? If I plug an Oculus into an Xbox, how's it going to handle compliance messaging and stuff as opposed to plugging in a competitor? Have you thought about that at all? Sorry, if you were to plug a, a Rift into an Xbox. If you were, sorry, well, if you were to, you, you had a platform that all three could be plugged into, all the three leading ones, how would you handle the compliance on that? Have you had any thoughts? Uh, I'm not sure exactly what you mean. So the Rift is a PC only device. <clears throat> yeah, so, so I got that as I was saying it. Sorry, if you were to, I tell you what, I'll take the question back. Thank you. Right, we, we'll chat sorry later. I'll that. come and find you. We'll, I'll, yeah. I'll talk to you afterwards. Uh, any other questions? Any questions? Please. Yes. Hi. Uh, thanks for the great talk. So, if nausea is a big problem on VR, on, in you know, many, many, many games. Do you have any tricks for developers how to you know improve the experience in terms of that? I've heard some you know things like to to make a virtual nose, which which uh, you know makes a player less nauseous. Is it? Is it true or is it a myth? Um, I think the jury is still out, but I, I think we have some suspicions that maybe it actually doesn't help at all. So I would be, I would be reluctant to advise people to build fake noses. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't think there's a silver bullet. Um, the key really is, is testing. You, at all stages, from a very early point in your development process, start working with play testers and, you know, especially a range of people, because maybe some people have stronger stomachs than others. So just try and get feedback on it as you, as you, as you work on it to find something that's comfortable. Obviously, um, simple things are avoiding you know, crazy camera movement. Try and keep it um, as simple as possible. In some cases, movement, movement itself isn't actually necessarily the problem. It's acceleration. So you could get away with probably linear movement. So maybe you have a, a scene where the, the camera has to move f through a scene. Perhaps you could get away with having it just instantly step to a new velocity and move through the scene at that velocity and then instantly stop again. And, and compared with having a, something which feels like it has inertia, so it's accelerating and then slowing down again, 
that's much more likely to make you feel sick than the linear constant velocity motion. And when I say acceleration, that includes uh, accelerating on a curve. So even if you're following a curved trajectory at the same velocity along that trajectory, because the, the, the trajectory curves, there's going to be accelerations there as well. So that's also going to be uncomfortable. So really, the, the, the only thing that you can do to ensure that something is completely comfortable is to have no movement at all. Um, and there's a lot of games you can do that work really well like that. I mean, if you've seen Kronos, it's a third-person game where every room is, uh, has a, a camera position. And you, you can look freely around, and you can move to the extent of the, the position tracking. Um, but when the character moves to a new room, there's a new, new camera position. And that's, that's basically a form of teleportation. And the trick that Airmec Command was doing as well, that's basically another kind of teleport. So those teleports um, basically do 100% solve comfort issues because there's no, there's no movement. There's just those snap position changes. So that's, if you can find creative ways to, to move around like that, then that's one way of doing it. Uh, but I'm afraid there's no, there's no silver bullet. OK, thank you. OK. So uh, you were talking about uh, basically uh, comfort in when viewing a virtual world. And uh, what I want to ask, because uh, testing the DK2 a bit uh, with different people, uh, there was al always the uh, difference in experience that was comfortable for some people and uncomfortable for others. And what I basically want to ask is, did you come to the point where following all the guidelines you have for, and basically having no artificial movement is comfortable for everyone? Or is there still a group of people that basically is, I don't know, has higher sensitivity for, for, uh, for this artificial experience and still experiences some nausea? So I, I think you're asking, is there like some strict criteria like saying, if there's no camera movement, then we'll class it as the most comfortable. Yeah, it's like if there is no camera movement, is it uh, in your, because I, I, I imagine you are doing broad testing with a lot of people, so is it comfortable for everyone or is there still a group of people that will not find VR comfortable at all? So I would say that, I'm not going to say 100% of people, but we do find that virtually everybody with uh, no camera movement is comfortable. This obviously is always going to depend on the game, though, because you could have a game which is 100% uh, static from a camera point of view, but maybe there's you know, some large object that's moving near you, um, and then that's going to give the illusion of movement, and then that might make you uncomfortable again. So when we're assessing games and looking at games, they're all the comfort metric that we use is always judged by eye. People play them, and a lot of people give feedback, and, and we work out how comfortable it is for everybody. So the guidelines that we give are, are guidelines. And that, uh, things like the no movement thing is a pretty reliable strategy for, for maximizing comfort. But it, it's not a guarantee, because we are going to play the game. And maybe there's something else in the game which also affects comfort. Um, so I mean, I would say test on a lot of people. Give us builds as soon as possible. And you know, we will give feedback. And I, I think, you know, if, like I said, if you have gone for the no camera movement strategy, then I, I'd be 99% confident that you're going to be very comfortable. But yeah, we'd love to be involved and, and talk to you about and give feedback about anything which we think might be an issue. Yeah. So within the store, when you submit your game, you have the option to mark your game as comfortable for most, comfortable for some, or comfortable for few. So that is your own assessment of what you think, where you think your game lands. Once you submit it to us, we'll let you know if we think that's true or not. So we might fix it a little bit. Um, but also, just because um, it comes in a certain way, say it comes in as comfortable for some, but you would like it to be comfortable for most. If you provide us um, and you say, hey, what can I do to make this more comfortable? We might actually, our engineers would look at it and say, if you remove this or if you help people anticipate movement or you know, specific to your game, we might be able to give you some feedback so it doesn't necessarily have to stay at the same place that we told you it's at. There is room for you to make it more comfortable. So it's, you know, that's a balance where we can consult you a little bit and, and help you um, be more comfortable. But it's hard to provide like very high level guidelines where you know, it really depends on how you execute and implement. Uh, but know that we have those ratings. It's basically like a green, yellow, and red. And it helps because if you're a player and you're buying the game, you know how comfortable, uncomfortable you are. So it let, lets you know not to buy really a game that has a red rating because you're not going to enjoy it. Um, but if you're uncomfortable, you should buy 
you know, games that are green or yellow rating. And that way we also have less people asking for refunds because it's not what they expected. So know that that's a part of how we rate games is that there's a comfort level with every game that, that you, you see on the store. Thanks. Uh, hello. Uh, I, I want to know uh, how much this, uh, this comfort is improved by, uh, by increasing the, the refresh rate. So yeah, so there's really two causes of discomfort. One of them is the one which does depend on things like refresh rate, the um, hardware improvements like the low persistence that's in the DK2 that wasn't in the DK1, and then there's improvements to the refresh rate, as you say, in the CV1 and the consumer rift, uh, and the, the frame rate is higher, uh, the optics are better, and all of those things do improve the discomfort that's caused from, from that side of things. So there's really two sources. There's the hardware source, and then there's the motion, the simulation source. And the comfort that you, the discomfort you will feel is really the max of those two. So you could, like, even the new hardware will eliminate all of this discomfort, but if the game is still causing discomfort, then it, this isn't going to help. So it's, it's whatever, whichever one of those, whichever one of those is worse is what the player will feel. Uh, and the, uh, the difference between the Comfort uh, using uh, the Gear VR and the Oculus Rift is, uh, is too much because, uh, because uh, the Gear VR has less refresh rate, isn't it? Um, so it, it's hard to compare them directly. They're, you know, they're, they're different types of experience. Um, there's a lot of tricks that go into the Gear VR that are different to the technology in the Rift that also really improve the comfort on that device as well. So it's not as simple, as simple as saying the refresh rate is, is lower so it's less comfortable. They, they both have low persistence. Um, they, they both have really accurate tracking. So when the software is, is really good uh, and the experience is well designed, then they're both extremely comfortable. Thanks. Uh, hello, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, we have uh, one uh, quick question regarding the Gear VR. Does it uh, work on? Uh, does it work with any other handsets uh, apart of Samsung? No. no, no. So it's just the. Mm -hmm. And the the, do, do you guys plan to to change that, or do you want to uh, focus only on the Samsung because of the partnership? Yeah, we um, you know we consider all things, but we don't have any like announced mm -hmm. plans at the moment. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so, by the way, how how do you address the the problem of limited uh, battery uh, of of the handset so that you, the players don't don't have to uh, you know plug the, the the device to the charger? So as a developer, there's a couple of tricks you can do. Obviously, optimizing your game so that there's there's less GPU work going on and less CPU work. Um, you can extend the lifetime like that. You actually do, as a Gear VR developer, have the option to change the clock speed on the CPU and the GPU, so, and you can set them you know, independently, and you can even change them throughout the game. So if you know that some part of the game has a lot of GPU work, you can increase the clock speed at that point, and then when there's less activity going on, you can turn them down again. So by carefully managing them like that, you can actually, as a developer, extend the battery life. Hi. Um what kind of work are you guys doing for crossbar experiences on both Oculus and Gear? For, for what type of experiences, sorry? Uh, crossbar, so buy one, get it on both platforms. Um, so yeah, that's the kind of thing that you'd work with a store team to, to arrange, and it's totally something that we're open to. Any more questions? Hey, hello. Um, I wanted to, like, if developer develops a game for Oculus, right, then there probably is going to be some sort of compliance also submission uh, process or not. I might, sorry if you already answered this question, I just missed the first part of the, of the show That's because okay. I was in a meeting, so sorry if you answered this question. But the compliance then, uh, so th this sort of process, uh, you guys are going to do it, and if, it, and if you have already established it, and if you did already, will come at a cost, or you guys were going to do it, like, for free somehow. That's the question. Thank you. Um, so I, I don't follow the question. So you're saying you, you submit a game for the Rift, say, and then 
Yeah, if there is like some sort of submission process, like it was for uh, for Microsoft or Sony, where you submit your game and like there is like a like a cost for that, and then they they can find, for example, must fix bugs, and then like you know you, you got rejected and so forth, so forth, something like that. Do you have also something like that? So or? there's no cost with the submission. You can make as many submissions as you want, and yeah, we'll take a look at it at whatever stage it's at, and we'll give you feedback and give advice on how to improve it and, and, and get it to the right level. But yeah, there's no, there's no kind of like official, this is the first submission, the second submission, and each one has a cost or anything like that. It's all completely, completely just us looking at your builds and, and talking to you, that's it. Okay. Any other questions? If not, I would like, to, on behalf of you to, is there any more questions? I'd, no? Andy, thank you very much. And do hope to see you next year here. Thank you.